Hello everyone and welcome to our Easter celebration from the First Presbyterian Church in Peru, Indiana. I'm Pastor Steve Quinlan and I'm glad to be sharing with you today. I want to give you a few words of introduction about what we're doing in this Easter celebration. In a time of social distancing and separation, we can't gather together as a congregation for Easter, but we can still share in the joy of this celebration. So what we're going to do is intersperse the recordings that we're making today, this announcement, uh, a sermon, and a pastoral prayer with the actual Easter Sunday celebration that we enjoyed last year in 2019. In that way, you'll be able to share with our congregation, our choir, our accompanist in the musical joy of that worship service and still hear a message that is fresh for this year. So with that, we're going to turn this recording over to our liturgist, which is Elder Betty Sprunger, and immediately following the prelude, she'll lead us in this Easter liturgy. And if there are no other announcements, please prepare yourself for worship as we listen to the prelude.
Thank you so much, Pam. He arose. Please join me in the call to worship found in your bulletin. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Come, see the tomb where he was laid. Come, touch the stone that was rolled away. Come, hear the story of our risen Lord. Our gathering hymn today is number 232, Jesus Christ is Risen Today. Please stand if you are able. Please join me in the prayer of confession. Let us pray. God of new life, forgive us when we were rather born in the old. God of the resurrection, forgive us when all we can see is death. God of faithfulness, forgive us when we are certain that we are alone. Forgive us, God of mercy. Make us aware of the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. Believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. <coughs> forgiven, we have peace with God and with one another. Therefore, 
Let us turn to our neighbor and offer the sign of peace, saying, May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you.
have two readings from the scriptures for this Easter Sunday, 2020. The first reading is from the Gospel according to Luke, the 24th chapter. The second reading will be taken from the Apostle Paul's letter to the church at Rome, Romans chapter 8. As always, before we read from the Bible, we like to pray together. So will you join me in a moment of prayer? Our God, the words that you speak to us are spirit and life. We pray that your spirit will breathe life into us as we read and proclaim these words this morning. We ask that you will lift the words from the pages of the Bible, from the words of the sermon, and make them living words in our hearts this day, so that we might hear the message that you have for us. In the name of Christ, who is the Word made flesh, we pray. Amen. Our first reading is from Luke's Gospel, chapter 24, and I'm going to read the first nine verses. But on the first day of the week, early at dawn, they came to the tomb, taking the spices that they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they did not find the body. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men in dazzling clothes stood beside them. The women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee? that the Son of Man must be handed over to sinners and be crucified and on the third day rise again. Then they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all this to the eleven and to all the rest. And so ends our reading from Luke's Gospel. Our second reading today is taken from the letter of Paul to the Romans. This is Romans chapter 8, beginning at verse 18. Once again, listen for God's word. Paul writes, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies, for in hope we are saved. Now, hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. And so ends our readings from the scriptures this morning. Easter. We celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, but you know Easter is also a kind of birthday celebration. Easter is, in many senses, a preview of life to come. It's the birthday 
of a new creation. And there's a constant repetition of that creation. The formation and the continual reformation of the world and everything in it, including us. You know, I've explained this to the congregation here in Peru many times, but I think it bears repeating often that creation is not something that happened once in an instant long ago, but is a process that continues on and on through the ages with new forms of life, new aspects of being that are continually emerging from what is. This is, of course, what science teaches us in their explanation of the processes of evolution. And so there's no contradiction in my mind between creation and evolution. It is a process that is going on even as we speak. It's not yet finished. It is coming into being. The language that the Apostle Paul uses in the passage that I read this morning from his letter to the Romans is the language, the metaphor of the creation giving birth to itself. That's a good way of thinking about what's going on around us, what God is doing in our world. God is acting, as it were, like a good midwife or the divine doula who is assisting, working with and in this process of the creation, giving birth to itself, working in and with us in the process of us being born again from above. This is the work of the Spirit in our lives and the work of God's breath in the world, bringing everything that is along in this process with gentle urging, with constant encouragement, with commands and directives. God is present in the process of the creation, being born from above, being reformed and renewed. That's what's going on in our world. And this birth, this creation, with all of its anxiety, with all of its pains, with all of its false labors and dead ends, all of these things are part and parcel of what is necessary for the world to come into being and for you and for me to be born from above, as Jesus said we must be, born from above by the presence and power of God's own spirit in the world. The story of creation in the book of Genesis, especially in the first chapter of Genesis, in which the days of creation are laid out, give us in symbolic form an explanation of how this process works. It's the voice of God, the word of God, that calls forth from the creation itself, from the world itself, its own being. God speaks to the earth and tells it to bring forth animals. He tells it to bring forth vegetation. He forms from the dust of the earth the human beings and breathes into them the breath of life. This process didn't just happen once eons ago, but is happening continuously even now. And this creation, this recreation, this continual creation is pressing towards an end, towards an aim and a purpose that God has for it. And that is 
the glorious liberty of the creation from all of its corruption, all of its death, and our liberty and freedom as new creatures in Christ. Jesus is often described in the Bible as the firstborn of a new creation. And so it's true that Easter is not just the celebration of an event that took place long ago when Christ is raised from the dead, but it is the celebration of the breaking forth of this new creation in a particular instance in new humanity in the resurrected Jesus Christ. It is a foreshadowing, an indication, a sign of what lies ahead for you and for me and for the whole creation. This is what the Apostle Paul declares when he says that in hope we are saved. And he goes on to explain what hope is. He says we don't hope for what we already see. We hope for what is promised but not yet seen. Each Easter, each year, when we celebrate the resurrection of Christ, we speak to ourselves the renewal of that promise of what is yet to be, but is not yet seen. We call ourselves, or hear God calling us, into a life that is shaped and formed by this hope. It's the vision of the future. It's the vision that God has for what the world shall be that invites us into its reality, moment by moment, day by day. That's what it means to live in hope. It's what it means to be saved in hope. It's not just a pie in the sky wishful thought about, I hope that I go to heaven when I die. No, it's much more profound and exciting than that. It's the hope that God has invited us to be a part of something spectacular that is happening all around us. The transformation of our world, the transformation of human society, the transformation of every individual human life by the beckoning, calling, summoning of God's own spirit working in and among us. And God has invited us to be no less than partners with him, co-creators, if you will, sub-creators, perhaps a better way to say it. We too have a role to play in working out this creative process. You know, that's why the apostle also says in another place that though we are saved by the power and presence of our Lord Jesus Christ, that salvation is something that we need to work out within us from day to day. And we do that as we cooperate with God in this good work of creation. Every good deed that you do, every uh, uh, service that we render to the environment or to human society or to our family and friends or, or even to our own health and well-being. Every deed that we perform as those who are called by God into a new creation that is emerging, all of those good deeds are acts of partnership in creation. They are faithful expressions of our hope for what shall be. Christianity of all religions, of all faiths, has this vision, this forward-looking understanding of the transformation of this world, not of some other world that we will go to in the, in the sweet by and by. It's not about the dissolution of this planet and this solar system, this galaxy, this universe, but it's about the continual reformation and transformation of this world by the power of God's own spirit working in it and working in us. 
That's what it means to be saved in hope, to participate in this great movement of God, urging us, inviting and calling us towards the future that God has prepared for us and given us the clear testimony of the life and death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. When I read the story from Luke's Gospel this morning, a story that we have heard over and over again of the women going to the tomb and discovering that Jesus is not there. The angel's message is, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. They were looking to the past, to the events of the past few days and expecting that there would be absolute continuity between those events of Christ's crucifixion, death, and burial. But what they were surprised by was the discontinuity, the change, the transformation that had been worked. Something new was happening. It was the emerging of a new creation of human beings, Jesus being the firstborn of a large family. It's an exciting moment to celebrate Easter with you today. It's an exciting opportunity to be a part of this process. And I am pleased to call it a process, this ongoing work of creation that we are engaged in, that God is working. It's not finished yet. It's not done. It's not complete. All of the enemies have not yet been defeated. But we are moving together in faith and in hope towards that end that God has for us. This is what we celebrate at Easter. The dark shadows of this present time, especially this time of illness and isolation, must never overshadow the hope that shines through, especially on Easter. The rebirth to a glorious new life, free from darkness and death, free from illness and pain, free from isolation and separation. That's what we celebrate this day. You know, the great Christian thinker and writer, C.S. Lewis, once described the sense of the new creation, and he spoke about how human beings, though we have not yet fully realized what God intends for us, yet that truth is present in potential. And if he said one time that if we could see who the people around us actually are, as God sees them in this vision of a new birth from above. If we could see people as God has intended them to be, then we would see creatures so glorious, so bright and shining, so wondrous and awe-inspiring, that even if it's somebody in the grocery line ahead of us, or someone that we pass on the sidewalk, that we would be tempted to bow in worship before these splendid creatures. Now, he didn't mean that literally, but the point that he was making was that when we interact with one another, especially when we interact with those around us who are not living up to their full potential, who are somehow underprivileged and uh, underrealized in their humanity, that we have a responsibility and a privilege and a joy before God to see those people as they will be, to see the glorious and, and, and splendid potential that is there before us in our children, in our grandchildren, in our friends and neighbors, and to act towards them in hope in the realization in our hearts and minds of the future that God has in mind for all of us. You know, the late Mother Teresa spoke to this point as well when she said that when she served the 
poorest of the poor in Calcutta, the untouchables, those who were scorned and separated from society, she was able to serve them because she saw in them the face of Christ. I believe what she meant by that was that she could see them as part of the new creation, see in them what Jesus Christ intends for them to be, to see with eyes of hope and eyes of faith the end, the telos, the goal that God has in mind, and let that goal for the future, that aim of God, shape the way we see the world and the people in it, and yes, indeed, ourselves in this present moment. That's our privilege. That's our joy. That's why we celebrate Easter as the first day of a new creation and look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, the pioneer who has gone before us into this new creation and invites us to come with him and to follow in faith and in hope. God bless you in this Easter this time when we have to gather together virtually, but I pray that we will hold on to that hope and allow it to be the source of our salvation individually and our salvation as humanity. Amen. Let's stand, if we can, and sing together number 245, Christ the Lord is risen today. Please be seated. <clears throat> if our ushers will come forward, we'll continue our worship as we bring our gifts and our offering to the Lord.
Our God, we thank you on this glorious resurrection day for the gifts that you give to us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Thank you for the hope and the promise. Thank you for the presence and the power. We ask that you will bless these gifts that your people bring now. Give us wisdom to use these gifts in your service for your sake. Through Christ our Lord we pray, amen. It's a joy to worship together with you this morning, and a big part of our worship experiences here at First Presbyterian in Peru is to share together in a time of prayer. Now, typically on a Sunday morning, we would invite you in the congregation to share your joys and your concerns. We remember, as we pray, that we are instructed in the Bible to weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice. So every Sunday we invite our congregation to share their joys and their concerns so that we can celebrate together and pray together, standing in solidarity with those who are in need. Now we're not able to do that in this context this morning, but I know that you have joys that you're celebrating. You can bring them to mind and name them now if you're with a family member uh, today, or even if you were alone, you can name them to God, the joys that you are celebrating. Because I know that even in a time in which we are uh, isolated and alone, and hear a lot of bad news through, uh, through the media and otherwise, we also still rejoice and have good news coming to us every day that we need to recall and give thanks for. So we celebrate with you this morning all of your joys. Now we also know that despite all that we have to give thanks for and rejoice over, we have many concerns, and especially in these days, it feels as though concern upon concern, anxiety upon worry, are piled upon us day by day. But we remember also that our God has told us to cast all of our cares upon him, for he cares for us. So I want to invite you to join me now in a moment of prayer as we bring before God our concerns together. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we have so much to thank you for this day. For friends and family, and loved ones near and far, for acquaintances that have been renewed, albeit at a distance. We thank you for the time that you give us now to contemplate, to reflect upon our lives and all of the gifts that we have received. We thank you, our God, for the news of health and wholeness and strength and healing for the many, many thousands who recover from illness, we thank you, our God, for good news that we hear from afar, new births, new anniversaries of life, new moments of celebration and joy. We thank you, our God, for all of these good gifts, for we know that ultimately every good gift proceeds from you, the source and giver of all life. Father, though we have much to be thankful for, we have much that concerns us, especially in these days. Of course, first and foremost, we're concerned with the health and well-being of the human family. 
especially because we live in this place, we're concerned with our near neighbors and uh, our fellow citizens in our country. As the death toll rises and more and more people become ill, we pray that you will help us with courage and strength and perseverance and patience and action where it is possible. We pray that you will help us to endure the times of separation and distance that we must endure to bring an end to this epidemic. Lord God, we pray especially for those who have lost loved ones. We ask that you will give them the comfort that only you can give. Help them as they grieve, to grieve well, and to remember with gratitude those that they have lost. We pray, O oh God, for those who are experiencing extreme anxiety and fear in this time, that you will assure them of your presence and give to them your peace, a peace that passes understanding. Lord God, we are also engaged in a great struggle now to overcome the scourge of this virus that is wreaking havoc among us. We pray for the leaders of our community, our state, and our nation, that they will act with wisdom and prudence, seeking the best possible medical and scientific advice and heeding it, and guiding us faithfully towards a brighter and safer future. Oh God, we want to get back to life as we once knew it as soon as possible. That may not be possible for some time. And it is possible that we will never be just as we were. Nevertheless, we pray that you will give our leaders the patience and determination to persevere as long as it takes and not to rush to a false sense of recovery and security before we have achieved the level of safety that we need for all of your people. Lord God, we pray today as we pray every day for all of those who are serving on the front lines in the battle against this illness. We pray for the women and men in the medical professions, those who are serving in hospitals and clinics as EMTs and first responders, all of the doctors and nurses and anesthesiologists and technicians and, and caregivers of all kinds, oh God, we pray for them today, for courage, as they've exhibited great courage, for patience, as they've shown us perseverance and patience. Oh God, we pray for their safety and ask that you will help our country, our world, to mobilize, to provide not only adequate, but abundant protective personal equipment so that every single one of our caregivers can be as safe as possible as they take care of us and help us to work together towards a safer and more healthy world. Lord God, bless them all, we pray. Lord, we know that there are many other needs, many other concerns that we have in this time. While life has changed dramatically in the past few weeks, Life also goes on, and there are those who are struggling in their lives with all of their daily struggles, with discouragement and depression 
and other kinds of illnesses, with the infirmities and losses that come along with age. Oh God, we pray for each one. Now we take a moment of silence and lift up to you all of those who are dear to us this morning. Now, Lord, we ask that you will hear us as we gather together all of our prayers, all of our joys, all of our concerns, and offer them to you in the words of the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now we return to our recorded Easter service and the final hymn and benediction. Our sending hymn today is number 233, The Day of Resurrection. Let's stand and sing together. Two. And now on this Easter Sunday and always, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord be kind and gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen.